Hello, and welcome to Talk from Superheroes. Hey, everybody, I'm Andrew Rivemi. And I'm Diana McCullum. And you're listening to Talk from Superheroes, where every week we discuss a, a piece of heroic television or film. And this week on the podcast, uh, we are doing, we are, we are dipping into the archives. We're doing one that, uh, that did the old slipperoo through the system, one of the, one of the big superhero ones that we never did. We're doing Hulk 2003, a pretty big one that just has, uh, has never really come up. It's never really come up because uh, there was the Incredible Hulk, which came out before we had a podcast, mm-hmm. and then there hasn't been any other Hulk things until She-Hulk now, which is why we've decided to do the 2003 Ang Lee Hulk film. We're getting all our Hulks in. We're getting our Hulks in a row mm-hmm. to me have a master Hulk rating when She-Hulk is over Yeah, you of got, all the Hulks. Everyone's asking for it. Everyone Ev- needs our... Our Star Hulk rating. They're they're clamoring for it. The notifications are blowing up, uh, and frankly, I'm sick of hearing it. We're gonna we're gonna do our Master Hulk rating. Uh, so we're working on it. We're gonna be talking about the 2003 Ang Lee uh, Hulk film on today's podcast, and uh, and we are excited to do so. But uh, but before we do, we do want to thank our sponsor of today's episode. We want to thank our friends over at tpublic.com. tpublic.com. I cannot uh, I cannot rank the, t- the shirts on tpublic.com because they're all bangers. Who could? They're all hits. Oops, all bangers. Oops, tpublic, you've done it again. It's the Every cr- shirt. It's the crunch berry of t-shirts. Oops, all bangers. It's just the hits, 100% from top to bottom. Uh, tpublic.com is going to be where you find your next favorite t-shirt or hoodie or sweater or tank top, whatever it is that you're looking for. If you don't need clothing, they also have uh, stickers, cell phone cases, laptop cases, wall art. Mugs. Mugs, lots of different options. Uh, so don't let the name fool you, but they do have t-shirts and they're all well-made, well-priced, shipped right to your doorstep. And the big thing is that all of the designs on tpublic.com are designed and submitted by independent artists who are getting commissions for their work. Yeah, these aren't designs made by the man. These are designs made by the fans. Oh. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Mm. You know what? It was actually pretty good. It was the lack of confidence, if anything, that made me fall fall apart on it. But I, I like it. I'll try to believe in myself more. But yeah, these are shirts made by indie artists who love what you love, and you're going to find a design you love that you're like, oh, wow, this person gets it. They mm. love the thing I love of pretty much any fandom. Uh, my shirt this week is uh, original Ninja Turtles. I'm going with green people. Uh, so uh, And it's uh, it's the OG Ninja Turtles. It's all four of them. They're looking fun. And it says squad goals because they're all hanging out and they're best buds and they're my squad goals. And that I want to be friends goal, with the Ninja Turtles. And it says squad goals in the Ninja Turtles font. You know the font. Which is a fun recognize. A lot of things that have an original font don't really slap the way Ninja Turtle font does. Ninja Makes Turtle you font, happy. Mm, it does. Squad goals. Squad goals. That's sure, a good one. I'm sure you like uh, The one that I am liking this week is uh, I am liking one called Gotta Go Fast. And you could probably guess who that is. That's our boy in blue. That's Sonic. I'm switching the colors. I'm going over to blue. Uh, it's a, a Sonic t-shirt. It's Sonic in the style of like a Steamboat Willie old like Disney kind of poster. Uh, so it's like a Mickey Mouse art style, but with uh, with Sonic. And it says Sonic in Gotta Go Fast. He's Gotta Go Fast. Uh, he's you gotta guys. go fast. Uh, and uh, just hold a little ring. I've been doing more running lately. I'm doing a half marathon next month. I, I akined myself to Sonic earlier, so I'm like, I think I gotta get a gotta go fast shirt. And I I'll have to ch- I'll have to check my top speeds once I wear the gotta go fast shirt. But that's what I think I need next. Uh, and you can find either of the designs we just mentioned or any of the ones we previously mentioned on the podcast, as well as other ones we've never brought up that we just think are cool and uh, we think are great designs you could check out. You can find it all at our storefront, which is over at tpublic.fromsuperheroes.com. That is t e e public.fromsuperheroes. Dot com and when you shop through that storefront not only do you support the artist who designed the uh, the the artwork but you also directly support this podcast as well even when you shop around the full store and find whatever you might like so visit boom double support pow pow tpublic.fromsuperheroes.com and thank you tpublic for your support thank you tpublic and let's get into it let's talk about 2003's Ang Lee's incredible hope is it incredible? It's just the Hulk. It's just Hulk. It's just Hulk. Just Hulk. Just Hulk. Just Hulk. 
I want to add The Incredible, but it's just Hulk. Well, that's because you're very kind. Oh, thank you. You're very nice to movies and people, and you just want to give them nice adjectives to describe what they are. Mm. But mm. perhaps not fitting in this occasion. Weird that it's also not the Hulk. No, just, just Hulk. Hulk. Just, Hulk. Which actually feels very Hulk-like. Hulk-like. Short, sweet, to the point. No extra syllables. No preface. Just Hulk. That's the movie. He doesn't call himself the Hulk. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm Hulk. What movie did we see yesterday? Hulk. That's it. That's all you need to know. So we saw 2003 as Hulk. Uh, I believe, uh, had you seen it before? I had not. First time viewing. Wow. First viewing for you. I think second time for me since seeing it in the theaters at the at the, the ripe year of 2003. Back in the hot year of 2003, what we got? We got Fantastic Four. We got mm -hmm. Daredevil. We all got the this. Hits. Oh, all the ghost, hits. Your of... Ghost Riders. Oh, all the hits. what a time to be a nerd. What a, <laughs> what a complicated time. Time where there were as many. And maybe Blade though. Uh, I think Trinity was around that oh, time. Oh no! Yeah, that I, Blade. We we did the math once, and as much as everyone's like, now is the era of the superhero movie. I think it was. I think it was 2003 to 2004 was the most superhero comic book movies made of any year, like including peak MCU. It, and but they just weren't bangers. You're getting like Ghostbusters two, Elektra, Catwoman, Blade Trinity. Uh, you're uh, you know like lots of uh, lots of lots of stankers. You know what? I think I've never shared that graph, but we did do that work. I'm, I should post that so people can see. Yeah, it was what Superman Returns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just a just a couple just a huge year of like years of forgettable superhero films. Yeah, a few hits in there, but but let's talk about let's let's get into Hulk. Is this one of the bad ones? Is it one of the hits? Diana, did you like it? I did not. Mm. Did not like uh -huh, this movie. Uh -huh. Very boring. Very slow. 2003 superhero movies should not be 2 hours and 20 minutes. We're upset when today's superhero movies are two hours and 20 minutes, and they've got like 22 minute movies to like backstory each time at this point. A standalone Hulk shouldn't be this long. Um, it's very long, it's very boring. There are like some interesting things. I actually think effects wise, it's really great for 2003. I think actually when he is the Hulk, sometimes it's kind of fun. Um, and. My only other compliment I think I wrote down is there's a really cool tree in this movie at some point. Uh, 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 <laughs> You're laughing, but you thought the tree was cool too. You also thought it was a cool tree. That is such a compliment as if you knew Ang Lee personally. <laughs> Like, as if Ang Lee was like, what did you think of my movie? And you had to come up with something. And you were uh, like, where did you find that really cool tree? It was a really cool tree, Ooh, though. That is what you say to a friend's play that didn't quite work. Okay, all right. But you're right. It was a cool tree. It was a cool tree. But yeah, I think the effects work. I think nothing else is good in this. All the performances are bad. The tone's bad. The pacing's bad. The story's nothing. Um, I actually, the, the transitions are insane and still somehow boring, but are actually like at least something new and original and kind of cool. And I actually kind of like the transitions. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really weird movie that you kind of remember and forget simultaneously. It's, it's everything and nothing. This is a very strange film. Um, so that's me, Andrew, did you like it? Uh, I, I did not, mm -hmm. but this is so complicated because it is so strange to see a movie that swings for the fences. I mean, aims for the stars, no holds barred, no apology, does absolutely everything in a bag of tricks that one could do while making a film and still comes out boring. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is what's fascinating about it is that by any by any empirical measurement this should not be boring mm -hmm. because it is doing everything all of the time and it still somehow turns out boring. Well, here's the thing about swinging for the fences. Mm. You can still strike out. You can. You don't necessarily hit the ball mm. when you swing for the fences. Mm. So that's just there's just been three strikes. Yeah. Angley's out. Angley's out, but like there is, there is. I agree that there is some stuff that works here, and I think that part of, part of what works in the successes of Angley's career, and I think this even within context that like, 
you know, there's maybe a, if there was a change here or there, there might be like an alternate Earth where this changed the course of superhero movies to be like now they all do the comic panel style and these type of transitions, where it's like Ang Lee has always unapologetically tried something that might eat shit hard. Like even when you look at how like Crouching Tiger completely shaped martial arts films for a decade to unabashedly use wire work, that was something that like could easily could have gone the direction of the approach of Hulk. Mm -hmm. Gemini Man using a higher frame rate that everybody hates. There are these things where he's just like, I made a wild decision early in the production phase. I am absolutely going for it. I will not release my foot off the gas. I will not apologize. And sometimes that creates incredible hits. And I, I at least really like that it is trying something. It's dangerous. It's willing to fail. Like I might even say that like this movie in Ang Lee's career, I'm like, this is someone who is willing to fail at – the peak. Like, I can't think of another director who is willing to fall flat on their fucking face, get up, dust off, and just move on to the next project the way Ang Lee does. Mm. And I do respect that about this film. And I think that that has been a constant on this on this podcast is that I would rather something lose me by trying something different than just bore me to death. So I do, I respect the approach, but the execution came out poor. That is a wonderful analysis of Ang Lee. And I also agree. I think there's like cool things here. And I actually think this movie could have been a big game changer for kind of superhero movies in a way if if it wasn't so at odds with itself about being a superhero movie. Because it's so weird to like read the interviews with like the actors and with Ang Lee about what he wanted for this movie. And he's like, it's Hulk, but it's not a superhero movie. It's a tragedy. And it's about like his, it's about his emotional scars. And I think, what was it, King Lear or whatever? Like he was comparing it to like these huge tragedies and like that's what it's going to be. It's like, so it's not a superhero movie. But I have put comic book panels in. And I'm like, well, is this super? Are, do you want this to be a superhero movie or not? Like, you've created this really cool new, like, the screen split, like, comic book panels, like, all the time, and there's cool transitions. But it's not a superhero movie, you guys. It's a serious look at this man's emotional trauma. And I'm like, but they don't go together. Yeah. Those, you, it's, it's such odds. And if it wasn't, and if it was just, I'm making like a really cool, and like the effects are actually great. If I'm making just a really cool, fun superhero movie, this could have been a banger. I agree, it could have been. And it's just so weird to have, I've never really seen a movie almost so at odds with itself about what it is and what it wants to be. It's yeah. like the Hulk itself. Yeah. This movie is Bruce Banner who can't decide if he's the Hulk or Bruce Banner. But I think thematically doesn't understand who Bruce Banner is either. So like there there maybe would be a way to execute that, but at odds is a is a great description of this. The most fun and playful things with things that have no uh, contrasted with things that have no sense of self or awareness or charm. Mm. So really a a real ride of things that are going on here. <laughs> what year was this was after Spider-Man? I uh, I think Raimi's. Uh, oh, three. I do believe this was after Spider-Man. Okay, because yeah. Spider-Man also did some fun, weird transitions, but yes. very sparingly. And I and I feel like this is like taken. It saw like it feels like he saw Raimi's Spider-Man and was like, "That's what superhero movies do." Okay, but we'll 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 crank it to one hundred, right? One thousand, one million. How many zeros like, can we crank the transitions to? This this kind of came out after after Raimi's Spider-Man, but like before Nolan's Dark Knight, mm. and it feels like it is something that has one foot in both pools at the same time, where it's just like we're serious, we're serious. Like, Psychological drama, but also Danny Elfman. Danny Blink Elfman is here, and Blink he's having blonk, fun. Blonk, 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 doo, boop, boop, doo, skibbity bop. It's the Hulk. Like, and it's just like you can't, you can't be in both of those things. No, Danny Elfman time. is doing his Danny Elfmanist best. Mm -hmm. He's doing, he's doing all the right things, and even just like the opening, like montages feel like Spider-Man esque in like the most drawn out way. They're possible in the most drawn I feel like I had listened to the full score by the time we finished the opening the opening montage slash like full credit sequence because it is very Spider-Man it's like you're seeing like DNA and experiments and this and that and it's the full backstory of this character way more than we need an insanely long amount like you can 
the fact that this movie is two hours 20 and it is, we've talked about movies that like you can cut 20 minutes off of. This is the most easily editable movie that I think we've ever watched that was too long where I'm like flat out the first 30 minutes do not need to exist in any regard or any way. Like it is, it is like they have no faith in the audience to understand how human beings ever exist. And he gets two origin stories where it's just like there was a man and this man did an experiment on himself. And that's a whole thing. And that's a story. And look at this man. And he has a wife. And when two people love each other very much, they have a child. Then there was a child. The child had a birthday one time. Check it out. It's Christmas. That does not come into play. This is not set at Christmas. We're just doing a scene at Christmas and moving on. They do one scene. And we're just like, hey, it's Christmas. It's established as Christmas. Outside. Christmas lights. Here's a gift. End of scene. No, so like just all of this shit to be like, we watch a child grow up and it grows up into adult uh, Bruce Banner, uh, who isn't even Bruce Banner, but adult Bruce Banner, who then uh, has the healing powers of his father from his experiment and then also gets blasted with gamma radiation. <laughs> so we get two origin stories. It's really, really clunky writing. It's really clunky. I don't know if if he doesn't think we know what human emotions are or if he does think he's telling a very interesting story. Mm. But I'll, I actually, maybe he doesn't think we know what human emotions are because even the scene you just mentioned that we didn't need, the Christmas scene where he gives him a present, like it felt like he was like, I have to establish that this man likes his son. I'm like, I probably just assume fathers who raise their sons like their sons. Yeah. Like he definitely loves his wife. Mm. And until he thinks his son is going to become a monster, question mark? He also really seems to like his son. So I didn't need extra scenes about any of this. Yeah, the movie is at first about his dad. It's it's a movie. The first 30 minutes is like the dad movie. Hulk dad. Yeah, the person who plays young Nick Nolte. Not even about Nick Nolte. Yeah. Whoever young Nick Nolte is, I think, has more screen time than Nick Nolte. Ooh, that might be true. Yeah. Because okay. then there's also the flashbacks later to killing the mom. Like, he's he's in it a bunch. Mm. Now, here is the other thing about how long this movie is. It's so wild that this movie is wildly long because what he does with the comic book framings is so interesting and should be saving so much time. Yes. Because you, because what he's doing with these frames is you have scenes like the Hulk is standing in the middle of San Francisco and he's also got four panels around the Hulk. So you can see in all directions that cops are coming to surround him at one time. So we don't need to show four separate shots of cops coming. So we have saved 20 seconds of film in this script, in the split screen technique he's using. It should be the most efficient method of storytelling. So that means if he was not using this split screen technique, this movie would be like three hours long. Mm -hmm. Cause the split screen is all the time. It's showing someone's reaction mm -hmm. as they're having a scene together. Instead of doing like an over the shoulder where you see the back of someone's head, you see both their faces. So we're saving time across the board through this film. Yeah. And it is still wildly long and boring. And it should be the clippiest, fastest superhero movie you've ever seen in your life. Mm -hmm. Completely at odds with itself. Not used for efficiency whatsoever in these comic book panel framing and flipping. You're absolutely right. I, I I couldn't agree more with that analysis of like it should be fast. There are times where it's being used where it doesn't need to, which is such a shame because there are times it uses it brilliantly and, and uses it in ways where I was flat out just like impressed that they got the shot. Uh, but there were moments early on where it's like pre-experiment where Bruce is getting the experiment ready and he's entering a pin code on a door and we just get three different angles of him entering a <laughs> pin code. And I'm like, that's actually not even like a comic book wouldn't waste ink to do like, that's not exciting enough to have three panels. It conveys no new information. It is just how a hand looks from the center, how a hand looks from slightly left and how a hand looks from slightly right. And we've got three squares on the screen showing all versions, but it doesn't add any efficiency. And it's not a scene that's important. Yeah, exactly. You're right. It's not like the code's going to be important later, or we're showing that someone is like memorizing the code from far down the hallway or something like, which is what a normal close up of a, of a lock is for. It establishes nothing. Yeah. It is just like, I wanted to do it. I wanted, I wanted to do it. And that was it. I wanted to film three angles on a lock. And then I showed all my nice angles on this lock. I'm 
angle and I'm good. Ah. I'm good. I've got all the angles. And how much that must slow down production as well to be like, we need to do every scene five, six times, different angles, get it, because I need the insert shots of the square within the square within the square of each angle of an actor. And then sometimes, and there was one or two moments where it was genuinely impressive. And I, I do think that like, not everything is about the expediency of how easy something is to film. Sometimes you have to do difficult things. And once or twice it was impressive. And I think it was the scene where we're introduced to Talbot, played by Josh Lucas, okay. where Jennifer Connolly walks into the room and the camera is following, or no, it starts on Talbot sitting in a waiting room. The camera turns over to Jennifer Connolly as, uh, as Betty walking in. It follows Betty. Then we get a picture and picture of Talbot of like a little square of his head seeing Betty from across the room being like, I'm gonna go say hi and getting up and walking into the other square. Mm. But the cameras are at an angle where each camera should actually sh show one another. But it was obviously two different takes that they morphed together at one point, which means that they had to film this scene multiple times, move the cameras around, film it multiple times again, get an almost identical blocking step for step from uh, Josh Lucas, who plays Talbot, and from Jennifer Connelly, who plays Betty. Like, the blocking to get some of these cross-panel mm. morphs that they would do, it was sincerely mesmerizing to be like, holy shit, that must have been so much work. But then it also affects the performance because the main three characters, uh, Eric Vanna as, as Bruce Banner, Jennifer Connelly as Betty, and Josh Lucas as Talbot, these three characters are unable to move. Like they are glued to the floor and their acting style also mirrors that where they just have to stay there and say the words because their scenes are the ones that have these transitions and they need to be in identical places for every camera angle and take. Yeah, it's I I was reading some of the interviews with the actors and they they all constantly talked about how many takes it was. So there is definitely like there's the fact that they can't move which is like what's keeping the energy low. And also their energy just might have been low. Like you spend all day doing a boring ass scene where you just walk over to an elevator. Of course you're gonna be like, hey Talbot, how's it going? Like you're just gonna be drained. You're not gonna have anything in you to be like, hey Talbot, do we have a relationship? Like something? There's nothing. Mm. These people have nothing left to give or were told to give nothing. It's hard to tell. Yeah. It's hard to tell. Because Sam Elliott's given stuff. Well, I I've noticed this. Sam Elliott and Nick Nolte are both giving a lot in their performances. But Elliott, I think they filmed on a weekend and would mm. not deal with any of the bullshit. <laughs> he was like, I'm I just going to look down the barrel. <laughs> All of his shots are handheld, whereas none of the other shots in this movie are. So that is immediately a tell. That like all of the ones with the main with Betty and Bruce, it is a camera on on a rig on a tripod smooth as hell to be like we're going to do this we're going to do this shot 9 times, we're going to do it mechanically identical, it's going to be the exact same. Most of the shots of Sam Elliott as General Ross is handheld. It's someone holding a camera and it's him in like an empty airplane hangar alone walking and talking on a cell phone. So it's like you had Sam Elliott for a weekend and he was just like, I'm not fucking doing that, Angley. Like you've got me walking around talking on a cell phone or you don't have me. And Nick Nolte was completely insane. Mm -hmm. So no one could control him. So Nolte is doing this like, big stage performance of like, oh, you, I left you alone, kid. What is it you're doing? Ah, ah, ah. And he's like waving his hands around as he screams. And no one else does that because everyone else was told to like, hit your mark, stand still, shut up. Mm -hmm. And so like, I think, I think it was direction. I think it was the style. And then I think it was two stars, one crazy, one who they had for a weekend who completely fought that style as well. Mm, I get what you're saying. I will agree with Sam Elliott. He's clearly like just on his own, not doing any bullshit transitions. Um, I'm not even sure about Nick Nolte though. Cause I think Nick Nolte might have a few transitions and as much as he is like kind of crazy, he is also still very quiet and just like, in on himself in the same way that like Bruce and Betty are to the point that like 
literally Sam Elliott's lines, even though they're spoken at a normal tone, are jarring because they seem incredibly loud compared to every other voice in this. And I do think that that is Sam Elliott trying to whisper. Yeah, that's not him being like, <laughs> rah, that's just like, I'm just Sam Elliott, I have a deep, low voice. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer Connelly walks up to him as Betty and she's just like, Father, what is it you're doing here? And he's like, well, what I'm doing here is it's just it's, like, and that's him. He's too, trying so hard to whisper. It's just too resonant. Mm -hmm. he, like the the, gra the gravelly bass just will not stop. He's just bouncing off the walls. He's like, that's the lowest I can go. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Ang. <laughs> Let me whisper to you a military secret. <laughs> like, okay, well, that's still too loud for the tone of this room, but okay. That's why they keep you in a bunker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't be trusted with secrets, Sam Elliott. No, but uh, Nolte does work. I think Nolte was good casting in at least the vo vocal range because everyone else is whisper acting. Mm -hmm. And Nolte is whisper acting, but it works because Nolte is insane. He's whisper acting, but he's actually acting. Yeah, yeah. And, and you were like, we, and Fool was like, we need to cast someone who can whisper act, but also deliver every line like it is their dying breath. And <laughs> Nick Nolte does seem like he is about to die at the end of every sentence he has ever spoken as a human being. <laughs> oh, ever, not just this movie. Ever. You're yeah. like, across the board. You listen to an interview with Nick Nolte and you're like, he's about to tell me where the treasure is and then die. <laughs> that is just his general punch drunk whisper whisper but gravel kind of energy mm -hmm. and I think that that at least like vocally matches with the other actors yeah he was quiet but he was interesting and it would have been maybe a more interesting performance in a movie where everyone wasn't at this same like boring ass level yes mm -hmm. but yeah, it, yeah it's, just, it's just disappointing across the board because like I feel like I don't know if Eric Bannon's a good actor um, but I feel like Jennifer Connelly is Jennifer Connelly she's can better, be better than, than this. this. Yeah, yeah, she's better than this. She's better than this. I don't know about Nick Nolte or Eric Bana, but she's better than this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think Nolte is a wild card as someone who can be an actor if they're cast in the right role or whatever. Bana, I don't think has the range, but I don't want to shit on him as an actor. I'm like, you might just need the exact right role, and also your American just isn't that great. Mm. Uh, so it's like you're fighting an accent, and also you're trying to whisper in an accent that's unnatural while hitting your marks for the like. You are trying to, you're trying to juggle nine balls at once and you're just not that actor and that's okay. That's okay. I mean, you shouldn't be the lead in a big budget movie, but I think that that also but could I, be. I, I wish you no ill will, Eric Bannon. Yeah, I, 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 I feel the same. I feel the same. But Connolly can do better. Connolly and deserves has better. and can do, does better. Yes. Do better. I've seen her in better. Even recently in Maverick, she was yeah. wonderful. Popped. Popped. It worked. Uh, well, let's take a quick break in the podcast to thank our other sponsor of today's episode. We want to thank our friends over at Masterclass. Masterclass, where you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, at your own pace. You're going to learn about all the cool stuff you want to learn about. Yeah, they have so much that you can learn. I've uh, recently been uh, learning uh, gardening, and uh, I've been learning, uh, yeah, yeah, gardening and uh, just general kind of like. Uh, uh, urban growing vegetation and uh, and fruit and it is it has certainly helped me out. I've been learning it from Ron Finley uh, and it's been very helpful. I uh, I learned that my my lettuce has been been shooting up or bolting, which is what's causing it to turn bitter. But that's fine because it's late in the season and I'm like I'm I'm learning things. I'm getting smarter. I'm doing better with my lettuce. Uh, but also I'm like it's okay that it's a, a, a little bitter. That just means that it's seeding. And also I'm. I got enough lettuce for the season, so I'm good, baby. This has been so great for our lettuce levels and also our confidence in our le lettuce levels in this house. Absolutely. Uh, the confidence has certainly, ha and obviously I'm growing other things, but uh, the classes, Ron Finley on uh, on gardening has been absolutely phenomenal. I really had a lot of fun with Matthew Walker's Science of Better Sleep. It was just such an interesting, like he is a sleep expert. It was everything about sleep, about like how we sleep well, what sleep is, what it's even doing. I've changed some of my habits. He had very good tips about like getting better sleep. I've switched to caffeine free sodas at night Ooh. and I've been sleeping better also caffeine free sodas are always fun <laughs> the technology has gotten better for caffeine to free sodas to remove the soda for late at night and you can you can explore lessons any order you'd like you can use it on your phone your app, tablet your apple tv your computer and the lessons are like 10 to 15 minutes in length so they're easy to watch you can watch a bunch at once you can just watch one or two the the classes are short and you're just like just shotgun some information from in like a cinematic quality oh yeah very well produced instructor. very easy to consume uh like a built-in notepad and a way of keeping track of your courses as well just a really well designed app uh, uh, that makes it 
that makes it easy. And you know, the more you remove difficulty from learning a new thing, the obvious, obviously the easier and better it's going to be. Uh, so we highly recommend that you check it out. Get unlimited access to every master class. And as a Talk From Superheroes listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. So go to masterclass.com slash TFS. That's masterclass.com slash TFS for 15% off Masterclass. And thank you, Masterclass, for your support. Thank you, Masterclass. And now let's get back into 2003 Hulk. Now, we did talk about, we've talked a lot about the transitions are like too mm. much or like they're too much work. But I do think like to be positive, some of them are so cool. Yeah. Some of them, there's this like really simple one that's absolutely unnecessary and it was probably crazy hard. I shouldn't actually say it's simple. And it's like, they're showing like the skyline of the mountains and Jennifer Connelly's car comes up and the skyline transitions into her car window in a way I cannot describe with my words from my mouth. And it's super cool. And it, tells nothing of the story. You don't need to do it, but it was an incredible shot. And I don't know why they did it, but it was so cool. Just the way these two images merged together as she drove into the scene. I don't un like just a whole bunch of things like that, that are just like, wow, that looked really hard. I don't know why you did it. Yeah, there were, <clears throat> yeah, there were some that didn't necessarily have like you know tonal purpose, but definitely looked very good transition wise. Yeah, they they hit a few, and then some that are even like playful that like aren't necessarily as stylistically like cool or beautiful as like the skyline to the window or a few of the other transitions like that might be. And then there's some where it's just like we zoomed into the frog's eye, and that's where the next scene is, and it's like. Well, that's silly and idiotic, but I'm actually having a great time with that. I enjoy that kind of like how playfully stupid that is, and it, I'm actually on. I think that that's good. Like, don't get don't don't uh, don't get me wrong when I call it stupid. I think it's stupid in a good way. It's fun. It's playful. It's not taking itself seriously. Superhero movies can be a little stupid. Yeah, we're not that so far up our butts about superhero movies. We're like they can be a little <laughs> stupid. Sometimes they we like that. They can be a little stupid, and it works. Like when Talbot gets exploded. I was just about to bring up when Talbot. This is was a so playful banger of a scene. So playful, and they've actually built up like quite nicely in the last like ten minutes that Talbot hates Bruce. We saw because I did like that Bruce threw him like as the Hulk twice, and then he showed up like with a neck brace and stuff. Because I'm like, that's the kind of thing you actually never see when someone gets thrown around by the Hulk. They always show up and they're fine. So I loved him like actually like mad about it, like in a neck brace with a hobbling um so they set up that he was being such an asshole so then for him to get his just desserts of getting blown up by his own little rocket that bounced off the hulk's pecs was so funny and then to be blown up and then cut out in a like youtube preview type of <laughs> cut out with the glowing outline <laughs> And then freeze framed and then pull back into a series of comic panels where we rotate the comic book page and go to a new scene. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably fun. Absolutely. Like if any other point of the movie was this fun, it could it could rock it up to like a like. Yeah. Like lit like or and it was shorter. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if more percentage of the movie was like this. Uh, that that little short sequence, so incredibly fun. How do you feel in your heart of hearts about the the photo that turns into a memory that turns into a dream? There were way too many layers on that one. <laughs> that was some Inception shit happening. And that, that was another example of like, you can't do everything in the movie. You don't need to use every trick that you know how to do. It's like, we're already doing this comic panel leap around thing. And then there's a moment where Bruce picks up a photo and then the photo turns into a memory and the memory turns into a dream and the dream turns into a nightmare. And I'm like, at one point we are inception layer deep where we are a nightmare within a dream, within a memory, within a photograph. And then it all pulls back. And I'm like, that was actually way too much. And we didn't even use the comic book transition effect. It was like, this is a whole new fucking style of movie we're doing here. Yeah, that was a new kind of like, like a little creepy of like, oh, the the picture just came to life. Like horror movie would be a much better way to use the transition they used. Yeah. Because it was like not quite a jump scare, but the the picture is very still. He's looking at it and then it like just comes alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but like interesting and well done, but mm -hmm. just 
What was that all about? What was that even about? Why yeah. do I care about Jennifer Connelly's dream? Yeah. This is Bruce's movie. It, yeah. This is about his repressed memories about his dad killing his mom. Mm-hmm. Why is she getting dreams? Why is she? Let me throw this out there as a, as a conceptual misunderstanding of who the Hulk is entirely. <laughs> At three different points, the Hulk cries, and I'm like, I don't think that that's... I'm not trying to be, like, hyper-masculine comic book fan about the Hulk, but I feel like once you start crying, you're back into Bruce. Yeah, the, he is he is rage personified. Yeah. But this movie does not say that. This movie says the Hulk is an emotional wound? It's He's a, emotional trauma. Yeah, I think, personified. I think it's. I think it's meant to. Yeah, it, it personifies emotional trauma in this mm-hmm. scenario. Slash, it is a man who was inside behind a door inside his own head, which was a very silly reveal. <laughs> the door was the door only was so funny, funny because the scene was so serious. The scene. The took scene it very was like serious. it's very serious that the Hulk is standing behind that tiny door. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, is it? The, is it though? To make to make the metaphor so very literal really removes the the seriousness of what of what the scene is trying to convey to be like, and now something dark is released inside of him. A door opened in his brain. Angry green man in there. And he's got a little wave. Yeah, to, to have a literal personification of anger inside of you and not just to be like the Hulk is the representation. I think that's now, a to be misunderstanding. Fair, to be fair to the three times Hulk cries, Jennifer Connelly also cries three or four times at absolutely inappropriate moments that did not call for tears. At inappropriate moments that did not call for tears writing-wise. As a performer, someone needs to send Jennifer Connelly an award for her work on 2003's Hulk <laughs> because her ability as an actor to force out one iconic tear out of a single eye in a long, unbroken take where the writing in no way has motivated it and Eric Bana is trying his best to say words with an American accent in front of her, and she does it with not, she is given, she squeezes milk out of a stone. She's given nothing and gets everything. And what an icon, what an absolute god of acting. That is a great point. She's given nothing. She gives everything via tear duct. Uh-huh. Not via any other orifice like her mouth or, or her face, but via tear duct she is giving giving it all. And also, as we discussed earlier, she might have had to do that like 10 times a day. Yeah. To considering how many angles Ang Lee needed. And he would have had to been like, cry again then. And she would have been like, oh God, dear God, okay. I got to do this again? Fuck. What, emo- what, like, what emotional impact were you drawing on in your life to be able to do that over yeah. forever? over and over in this not good movie. That is impressive. You know what? I wasn't I wasn't giving her enough credit. I was mostly just like, why does this scene have tears? But acting wise, I, very impressive. You you were right to criticize the writing that got Jennifer Connelly to a place where she shouldn't have had to put the whole production on her goddamn back like a hero. Uh, but she did it and the writing put her in a bad place. Because like it's said that um, Eric Bana has one scene. Bana or Bana, I never really know where the emphasis mm, is. He's uh, never gotten famous enough for nah. us to all talk about it. So he's he, always yeah. just been medium level famous where I'm like, I can spell it. Never heard a single mm. person say it aloud. That final scene with his father, with Nolte, where they're like yelling at each other in front of the like, they're locked up in the, the hangar and they're yelling at each other. And he and he tries to cry, but he's giving a oh, full on Dawson, yeah, yeah, where he's yeah, just yeah, squeezing yeah. his full face, trying to get the juice out, and no juice comes out. Yeah, like he thinks if he just squints enough, there will be a tear. And it's a shame. It's like, oh man, oh. like you can't. And like I'm not trying to judge. I can't. I couldn't. I'd give the exact same performance. But you shouldn't have been put in that position as well. Like, you had no writing motivation. Clearly, your days acting were hell on this. You can't You can't do it. And Connolly can. Connolly can. But she's a goddamn superhero. Uh, and and you can't do it. Like, Eric Mana is given a scene with the writing motivation to cry and can't do it. Hulk cries three times. <laughs> 
because the CGI artists are able to get that tear rolling down. We can get Hulk to cry. And Jennifer Connelly does it three times on her own out of sheer force of will. So that's kind of where the the arc of this movie is at. So really just like a lot of tears. Like there'd be so many more if Eric Bana could cry. Yeah, yeah. He would have probably knocked out a few when he was like hulking out that first time. I love the first time he's hulking out because he's just reading the internet alone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's just like the internet has made me mad, I guess. I get it, my dude. I get the next it. time he hulks out, it's like a big deal. He's like, oh, Jennifer Connelly's in danger, and my dad said he's going to kill her. But the first time, he's just like on his computer clicking away, and then he's like, ah! I hate Talbot. I think he was reading an article about the company was and was trying to buy his research or something. Sure. It was yeah. very unmotivated. Absolutely unmotivated. Very much so. But I will say, I do, uh, another positive, I do think that obviously they are dated, but I do think the visual effects of the Hulk work like it, it's nothing in compare it, it is you know uh dark ages behind you know what we're used to now from mcu movies uh but it is pretty damn good for O three. 3 i think i will actually give this movie a ton of credit for the hulk looks pretty damn good for O three. 3 they constantly show him in direct sunlight The whole desert sequence. Which is a bold choice. That's the bold choice. Because the first like 45 minutes, they keep putting him in shadows. And I'm like, well, of course, because the technology is not there. But then the last two thirds of this movie, it's all broad daylight Hulk. Like San Francisco's broad daylight. The desert's broad daylight. It's all just right in your face. And the sequences are long. Like that desert sequence where he fights the helicopters and then gets blown up at the base and then gets to San Francisco. Like that's like a 20 minute CG Hulk sequence. Yeah. That's a huge amount of work. And also, I think this is the only sequence that's also, like, fun. Like, the Hulk, like, like stumbling in the sand had, like, a little bit of charm to it. Like, he's super powered, but he also can still trip in sand. The way he would catch the missiles and throw them back. Um, the way that he just kind of starts running in a circle, which kind of felt, like, a little bit like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragony. Like, if it right. was CG instead of wire work, he was like, I like circles. Just run in a circle. That's my thing. It was... It was honestly like the most fun I had in the movie and a very impressive sequence. I, I fully agree. Yeah, I think they nailed that that desert sequence for sure. Everything had weight, which is another thing yeah. that's tough to do in CGI. Because like the, the tanks are actually breaking. Mm-hmm. Those aren't CG tanks. Like I don't even know how they did that really. Right. Yeah, it's, it's impressive. It is impressive some of the work that they did. There were a few times where I felt like the sound mix was missing some thuds where he mm-hmm. was walking with kind of a soft step or whatever and it didn't quite hit hit as hard as it could have but in terms of visuals yeah like he had weight they figured out the skeletal structure the movement the little falls the fumbles the way he grabs a missile like everything felt kinetic and which is really tough because as you mentioned a it's broad daylight uh and b aesthetically and this is kind of i think more of a like an artistic decision and probably would come down to ang lee or the directorial team more than the actual like computer artists who generate it but they chose a really horribly unrealistic neon green mm-hmm. for the Hulk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A very unforgiving, cartoony green. And that's not on the CGI department. That is on that is an artistic choice that that Ang Lee or someone uh, told them to do. That was a color they were told to use for the Hulk. And it's very unnatural and it's wildly bright and it doesn't reflect other colors and it shouldn't look right in the desert. It shouldn't look right in the city. And they made it look pretty right. And in broad daylight, like it was, yeah, it was, it was like taking a, taking a sprinter, like a, an Olympic sprinter and just putting a weighted vest on their chest and then giving them cinder block shoes and being like, run this. And they ran it like every disadvantage possible and they still did really damn good. Yeah, really damn good with long sequences. I expected like five minutes of actually CG Hulk in this movie, to be honest, considering the time frame it was made. Because even today, like, you re- I'm reading up about like how many scenes like the animators told She-Hulk's showrunner to like make, could she be Jen in this scene? We don't have time to CG her. Like, so like today we don't have time to CG a lot of Hulk. So for this movie in 2003 to be like, it's going to be two hours and 20 minutes and a lot of it's going to be the Hulk. Mm-hmm. Impressive stuff. It really does work. Yeah. And also the the early 2000s at the 
the visible beginning of San Francisco aggressively offering film <laughs> credits for yeah, things to yeah, shoot yeah. there. They like, didn't use the little windy road. They didn't use the windy one. No, I forget the name of that hill. But yeah, yeah, it is very much a like pre-2000, nothing film in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And I don't know when San Francisco was like, we're getting aggressive with tax credits and filming productions. But it, clearly it was like 2000, 2003. And then this was the first like one of the first big ones where it's like, hey, check it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one, X3, Ant-Man, there's probably more. Yeah. Um, Shang-Chi. Yeah. Uh, So, oh, and also effects-wise, it was much smaller and simpler. The effects when Nick Nolte got powers were incredible. Not bad at all. When his arm becomes part of the blue metal thing, honestly haunting. I was, and he's just like moving it, and it is metal, and then it becomes a finger again. I was so drawn in i can't even tell you i mean i'm sure this was actually a very simple one but it was Mm -hmm. so simple that it was like shocking to me it looked great yeah they were like kind of revisiting your like your t-1000 from terminator 2 type of a vibe but like with the malfunction stuff and like and even by that was groundbreaking then and even by today's standards it's still a difficult thing to do and they did a very good job of it as well Yeah, I don't think they did a great job of him as a giant electricity monster uh, or defining his motivations. No, uh, that's not the, that's not on the CG. Or, that's not on the CG department. I, yeah. Defining Nick Nolte's motivations in any day of the week is hard. It's a challenge. I'm not going to put that on the CG team. So let's talk about the 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 hero's journey of this, the ba- the battles of this, because I need to talk about how the fact that this is a movie where the hero. The, the Hulk, Bruce, like an, the Hulk? Okay. an anti-hero, a complicated victim of their own, whatever, but the, the, the for more or less the hero. The hero is someone who rips three dogs asunder. <laughs> the villain murders a security guard, like a campus, a campus research lab security guard. Just a guy who heard a sound and walked into the room. Yeah, and then... All of the military people survive, and they make a weird point to state that as well. <laughs> or I'm like, I think you've really focused on the the wrong scenes here, but okay. Yeah, it was very weird because in the in the desert scene, they made like it's like they had it's like somehow they had seen uh, Man of Steel already because every time a, a helicopter was shot down over the radar, would be like, I got out. Okay. I'm fine. Like the, they were, every single pilot radioed in to be like, the Hulk did not kill me. Don't you worry about it. Like they were worried about him not looking like a hero if there was collateral damage. But we, but we watched him curb stomp a French poodle. Three dogs. What the fuck? Three dogs were ripped in half, like turned into literal dust. And this is what's so upsetting. Uh, no matter what, when a dog dies, very upsetting. But these dogs were hulked out against their will. And the whole point of this movie and pretty much every Hulk movie is Betty Ross running out and being like, it's not his fault, don't kill him. Don't kill the Hulk, he's an innocent man inside who can't control what he's doing. But we murder these three dogs unforgivingly like they're evil Mm. and they're not they're just hulked against their will and they deserve some kind of like hulk pound rehabilitation rescue center something some something talbot should have found them unconscious talbot should have found them unconscious and been like these are cool i'll take them in and train them to be military dogs or like they're with the hulk at the end or something anything well pack but he punches one down its throat and <gasps> comes out of its ass. <gasps> it was so upsetting. And that was the first fight scene where we are introduced to the hero of this movie as he violently murders three dogs. Three dogs that like we met before, not even like random like like wolves right. from the forest or something that might be like you don't have any attachment to. Like dogs that we've met three times at the hospital that were like, hey man, what's up? Yeah. I'm a Rottweiler, I'm a poodle, I'm whatever the third dog was, maybe a pit bull. I'm, I'm a normal dog. I'm a normal, well-trained dog. You'll murder me later. Please don't kill me later you when you're the Hulk. You will kick me and I will turn into dust, literal dust. Like, I assume that was their blood because their blood's green now. Yeah. So, yeah. like, they just turned into blood dust. Well, yeah, mist. yeah. Yeah, green mist appeared and their physical forms ceased to exist, so they were kicked into out of existence. At this point, I do understand why the Hulk cried. 
Yeah. If I had to kill three dogs? I'll do. You would just simply not. I would not. I mean, if they were attacking me, mm. I would try to go for the knockout. I think you would show some restraint. And I that's would. the other thing that's a problem is that if Hulk has enough consciousness to cry, <laughs> to mourn and lament over a life lost, <laughs> then he can know not to punch a dog's face so hard your fist comes out of its ass. You could know not to do that. I think that's a wild stance that I am taking on that one. You are always about the hard stances. You're you're willing to like take the risk of being like, you're going to say the things people don't want to hear, yeah. which is that you shouldn't punch a dog through its mouth to ass. Thank you. Thank and you, you know what? We're probably going to get some backlash. Thank We're you. We're going to get some mad tweets. Tired of the tweets. It's But you got to just... Power through. I'd lo- but I like to punch a dog from from face to rectum. Well, what do you what do you get out of here, tweet? <laughs> that's what tweets here. sound like. Get out of here, tweet. That's, that's I like that's the voice you read every tweet in. Absolutely. Get out of here, tweet. Ones that disagree with me anyway. And movie about about killing three dogs. Not cool. But all the soldiers are fine though. But all the so all the military soldiers who attacked him, even though he was just hanging out in the desert, and they're the, cool. And the private company people who then Talbot died. I'm pretty Talbot sure Talbot's died. dead. Tal- Talbot is the only one who dies. Unless he has some kind of like force field, and that's what that was, that mm. little image around him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talbot dies. We don't see Talbot die, but Talbot dies. And I guess the dad died? I guess? I guess? What even happened there? He like absorbed too much Hulk energy, and then there was a nuclear blast. He turned into like a brain. I thought he just turned into a cloud. I thought he was turning into like just thoughts in a brain. Uh, okay. It was very unclear. It was really, they didn't know how to end that fight sequence. Oh, no, 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 no. Because no. they were like, this man has been incorporeal multiple times, and we actually don't know what to do with this, so let's just end it. A few of the times where he was incorporeal, it looked really cool. I liked when he fought him as a cloud. Uh, it was neat. That was at least a stylistic choice. Yeah, that kind of worked. That yeah. was actually like neat, and he looked kind of cool as a rock as well. It was nonsense, and mm. it didn't mean anything, but I was like, you look cool as a rock. Well, it, it, it did look cool. It was, and you know what? That's a good, that's a good uh, breakdown of the story of these characters as well. It was nonsense. It didn't mean anything, but occasionally it looked cool, and you're fun as a rock. You're fun as a rock. You're fun as a rock, because, yeah, this whole story of his, his dad, uh, David Banner, played by Nick Nolte, of the, like, I was a scientist, and I experimented, and I worked for the government, and at one point, the government was like, hey, don't forget you work for us. So I experimented on myself, and I blew up the town. Then I murdered my wife, and I tried to murder a baby. Then I left, and the baby raised itself, question mark? No, Sam uh, Sam Elliott didn't know the baby you had been genetically right. changed and just gave him to a family for adoption. He was just like, and I, I didn't know your kid was weird, so I just put him up for adoption. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. But that Nick Nolte has super healing as a mm-hmm. normal, he, he basically like kind of a super soldier. I don't, he's has super healing. He has and something. S- and so does his son, but they never really explore or elaborate on that. I'm not sure if he does have it. Because like when he in the flashback or in the origin story or whatever, Bruce got hit in the head by another kid and he was bleeding, but he wasn't crying. So I don't know if he didn't feel pain, but he did get hurt. And I think the gamma rays like really made you powerful. Mm-hmm. So I think they didn't really have anything going on until they got gamma rayed. So then let me ask you this. Why do any of that part of the story? To explain why everyone can't just turn themselves into hulks. I, I, I understand that. Because then everyone would just stand in front of some gamma rays and be like, we're all hulks. I understand that in a world where these were machines that were easily accessible. But this is the only place doing it who was on the verge of a breakthrough whose funding was just pulled and Hulk then destroys the machine. Mm. So why we need to set up that like, and also everyone can't do it. I'm like, I assumed everyone couldn't do it because... One man invented it, and now it's destroyed, and no one has any of the things. Mm. So, like, I feel like they set up, like, three times to be, like, why you can't just have there someone else do it. There was definitely an easier explanation. He also made the dogs pretty easily, though. So I think if you just got some gamma rays and a little bit of their DNA, you can... And that's the other thing that's frustrating. They're like, here's three reasons why no one else can do it. <laughs> but also we can make the dogs. But also one person can 
can kind of do it to dogs and himself. But that's because he breaks one of the three rules. So it's like, ah, there's too much. There's too much there. I, I absolutely agree. There's way too much backstory explanation of how the Hulk came to be. And on top of all that explanation, I don't know why it mattered that he blew up the base. Like, that didn't give Bruce his powers. It didn't give him his powers. It mm. didn't seem to have killed anyone. Like, Jennifer Connelly's dad lived. She lived. They had a lot. Like, why did a giant green cloud come up? L what was the green cloud? And, like, the restaurant's closed, but the whole base and installation is still there and is actually bigger than ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So why did we blow it up? There's no reason. There's no reason there's that you blow it up. There's no reason for the story for it to be blown up. There's just nothing matters, and there's too much. Yeah. Nothing matters, and it's all too much. Because the story really does make it seem like it's like he's going to come home and kidnap his kid, and maybe like your mom, the mom got blown up in the explosion. And then he stabs the mother, and the explosion doesn't hurt anyone. No, the explosion's way over there. Yeah, so just a lot of like, well, then why did no, we do that? We oh. really set up some weird... Okay. Weird things. I guess. Guess. Sure. Uh, oh, I'm feeling good on uh, on Hulk. How are you feeling? I'm feeling done. Yeah, I'm I don't done. Know if good is the word. I'm done. Yeah, it, in a different different timeline, different universe, this movie and its transitions could have been a thing. I think like this could have been like we use we use comic book transitions in movies now. If it was like if the whole movie was as fun as Talbot dying. Yeah. It would have been like, oh shit, yeah, that works. Look at him. He's got a fun like Austin Powers-esque outline around him as he blows up. This is... It could work for a... Con like, I would actually be very interested to see someone else try this. It'll never happen because this, you know, blew up everything that was possibly related to this. But Did Sin City do panels or just on-screen text? I think they did on-screen text. It's been a while since I've watched I Sin also City, have not though. seen Sin City for a long time, but I know yeah. that was the other close, like, it's like a comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's so, been a minute. A little bit like different. I feel like that movie there. doesn't hold up. Well, you know, I mean, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll cover that someday, it'll, so it'll we'll see. It'll eventually come up. But. Well, let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? So now that we've discussed everything we discussed, what would you change about this if you could change anything? Uh, but before we do ask that final question, we'll remind you, as we do every week, uh, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us move up the charts. It helps us find new listeners. And it's a free way to support the podcast, so why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you leave us a review? Tell us something you like. Do you think dogs should be punched through the mouth to the butt? Do you think there's a cool tree in this movie? There's a lot to discuss. I forgot. I'm, we didn't discuss the cool tree. It's a really cool tree. <laughs> I actually genuinely mean that. But also, like, reviews are equally as cool as this tree. We would love to hear from you. Let people know that you like our podcast, that they will also check it out. And we will explode like Talbot did in this movie. We certainly will. Uh, and that's a free way to support the podcast. If you do want to support the podcast monetarily, you can do that over on Patreon, which is a monthly subscription service where you can subscribe at whatever level is in in your budget, and depending on what level you subscribe at, you'll get different levels of cool bonuses as well. Uh, so even at the even at the one dollar level, you get our web comic text from superheroes a day early. So you're always going to get something, no matter what you donate. Uh, and as well, if you do the ten dollar hero level, you get an exclusive bonus episode of this podcast every single month. Uh, this month's bonus was Lord of the Rings: The Two Towers, big one, big one. So if you want to hear more Lord of the Rings from us, that's over on our Patreon and a pretty fun episode. If I do say so myself, a pretty fun episode. Also, at the one dollar level, people have been enjoying uh, the the text early, and uh, you can also help me proofread them because you guys have been finding some mistakes, and I've been really slacking off, and I appreciate <laughs> it because then I get to fix them before they go public. So thank you to all my proofreaders over mm. on Patreon, unofficial who are, proofreaders, who are finding my errors. Uh, <laughs> we do appreciate you, and we appreciate the patrons for supporting the network. Whatever it is that's in your budget, and you can cancel or change any month, or if you want to hang around for a while, you can do a one year level and then that gets you one month for free if you sign up at the year level uh, so whatever it is that you want to do have a look poke around check it out at patreon.com slash from superheroes that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash from superheroes 
And now, let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? Diana, what would you change? Uh, this movie's shorter, mm -hmm. but in terms of just like story-wise, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to make it a little bit more interesting. I'm going to hopefully add a little bit more energy. I'm going to add more Talbot. I think Josh Lucas is actually kind of fun, and there should be a little bit more of him. So Talbot is going to sabotage the gamma ray machine, and that's why Bruce gets blown up with gamma rays. Because he thinks if Bruce dies, Betty will come work for him. So Talbot's kind of just going to be the main antagonist of my version of this movie. He does. So he sabotages it. He's the reason Bruce gets hit. He's like, well, that didn't fucking work. He steals some of his DNA when he has him in the base. And he does manage to Hulk himself out. So Talbot becomes a Hulk and is the main villain of this movie. And then the dad still has powers. And they still do this weird thing where, like, the dad at the end of this movie is like, give me your energy or something. But because this whole movie, the dad is like, I killed your mom. He needs a redemption arc. So in my version, Bruce is fighting Talbot, and the dad gives Hulk all of his energy so that he can beat Talbot. Dad mm. dies, redeemed a little bit. Um, he's still kind of a jerk. Uh, and then Talbot gets defeated, and then Hulk can just go off on his own with his dogs who are alive. With his live dogs. They go to Mexico. They help defend those, yes. those he civilians from the bad guys that were there. Um, so yeah, Talbot's the big bad that he's fighting. It's kind of like a villain throughout the whole thing, peppering a little bit more, a little bit more intrigue, a little bit more drama. And then Dad does a sacrifice play to help Bruce out at the end. I love that. I, I love it. I think that that's terrific because I do agree. They have three antagonists in this movie and they all just kind of get in each other's way and no one. No one's really evil. No one's no one's really evil or they're evil at different and inconvenient times. So that actually would a little, add a bit more of a through line to be like, it's Talbot. Talbot is it's Talbot. the bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ross is inconvenient. Uh, your dad is a psychological trauma. Talbot's the bad guy. Yeah. So that's 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 the best I can do with this film. It's really a lot of like choices that Ang Lee made, but just mm. writing wise, that's my my big change. Andrew, what would you change? Uh, my big change is uh, I love that I'm on board. My big change is using the comic panels for efficiency <sighs> in storytelling. Uh, so I I I I think that. I mean, like might be a strong word, but I would like to see I I, I would like to see a version of this where they still use the highly stylized comic book panels and transitions and how they do it, but in a way that doesn't force the actors to give a stiff whisper performance, because at the end of the day, I don't need to see a picture in picture in picture of three different angles of Jennifer Connelly's face. She's lovely, I wish her well, I don't need that. But there are ways to increase efficiency where rather than making the actors do a scene so many times they hate it and they are stiff and they're uncomfortable, why don't we just use it to tell the B unit shots and everything that's going on? Like there is an entire scene between Bruce and uh, and Betty before he gets gamma rayed, where they're having a conversation, and you get like a picture and picture of Betty and like whichever one isn't talking, and then afterwards it cuts and it shows us like the third assistant at the lab who's working on the thing who gets electrocuted, and I'm like. You should always have a ticking time bomb in the second image. Ooh. So that should be the thing to be like, we are playing out this scene. And this scene is like, are we like, are we gonna get bought out? What is going on? We are discussing a threat. Well, there's another threat under the table that looms under us. And that is what this should be used for, which is to be like, look at the literal interpretation of the subtext of this conversation. So it should be, we're talking about what the future of this experiment is going to be while it is going haywire, cut to, boom, now we're moving forward, gamma radiation. You know, it's going to be like, we're having a, a conversation about like, bringing in the the dad to have a conversation like is the dad going to surrender meanwhile we're showing the tanks that are bringing him back to the base while they have that conversation knowing that it is actually a ticking time bomb this should add and heighten tension as opposed to slowing everything down which is what it does. Mm. So I think that that is my thing, is that everything that was a, a second unit director, everything that is a shot that the lead actors aren't in, is what should be displayed in these comic book panel, picture-in-picture -picture transitions for expediency of storytelling. 
I love that and think that is so cool. And I feel like you've put more thought into those two examples than maybe the whole movie did on how they used any of their transitions. Like, yes, of course, we're getting bought out and he's fixing a thing. Like, Betty could be discussing with her dad if we're going to, like, let Bruce wake up, but you can show him in the tank the whole time and, like, really add stakes and add tension to scenes that are boring. I think that is brilliant and would work so much better than how they use the transitions in this movie. And instead of getting the the past, uh, we revisit these scenes in the past of the original base, like, nine different times. We could easily just have one scene, like, that final scene between... Because it's all about, like, he's been stifling his past like that one scene with him and his father and it could be like i remember what happened and then we could get the picture in picture of the comic book panel of him remembering i saw you stab my mom and then the dad doing the like you don't remember it right and we get the picture in picture panel of him trying to stab his child <laughs> and just these but these these mm -hmm. contrasting of like this is how a comic book would frame this storytelling device to mm -hmm. be like we're doing a Rashomon I remember things differently than you remember things I'm telling a thing cut to while juxtaposed while I'm still talking but I think it's just a, a a misunderstanding as to how comics tell its story is what they executed and I think a a better understanding of how comics tell their stories and using it to make make it more efficient. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I feel like I'm just going to throw, go on a limb and say Ang Lee actually is not much of a comic book reader, judging by the fact that he wanted to this movie to not feel like a comic book movie. And I think your inherent understanding of what makes a great comic instantly made you better at this panel idea. Hmm. Thank you. And I think it's great. I think it would work wonderful. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, well, that is going to be it for this week. That's it for 2003's The Hulk. Uh, as well, I uh, want to give you the heads up. Uh, you might have heard us mention it previously on the podcast. But if you don't know, we're going to be doing a 24-hour live stream charity event on November 5th, which is very exciting. Uh, it is called Extra Life Game Day. Some of you may be familiar with it. If not what it is, it is uh, a bunch of different creators from all around the world sign up to do 24 hours of, uh, of streaming with all of the proceeds going to charity. Uh, it goes to the Children's Miracle Network, and specifically our stream is going to be going to Sick Kids Hospital, which is a, uh, a fantastic place that helps take care of sh sick children and helps uh, relocate and assist families during difficult times. And we are going to be doing a 24-hour live stream to Twitch, and during that live stream, we're going to be doing a bunch of different things. We're going to be doing live tapings of this and the other podcasts on the network so live tapings uh stream directly to twitch of, of talk from superheroes i hi bye lie the villain was right and the fandom show Woo, uh, all the hits all the hits we're going to be doing a uh, a jackbox games night as well so you'll be able to play along with us and hang out there uh we're going to be doing some video game streaming some watch along parties for lord of the rings as well uh so there's going to be lots of fun interactive stuff and it's all going to charity. If you go to extralife.fromsuperheroes.com, you can see more about the event. You'll see the schedule. You'll see our prizes and incentives, and you can donate from that page. Lots of prizes and incentives, by the way. Like, we have free t-shirts from tpublic.com. Every $20 donation gets you an entry in the prize draw. Yeah, you know and love tpublic.com. You heard us talk about them off the top. You can win one instead of purchasing one. Easy. So, Excellent. So every $20 donation gets you an entry in the prize draw with uh, free shirts from tpublic.com as well as more sponsors to be added uh, closer to the date. And as well, at the if you donate $50, you will get uh, an exclusive access to to all previous Patreon episodes for all the podcasts on the network. So it is it is not an ongoing subscription, but if you're like, I wanted some of the Patreon episodes for I Hate It But I Love It or Villain Was Right or maybe even this podcast, but you don't want to be a patron for all three, you don't have it in the budget, this way you can donate $50 uh, and it's all, uh, it's all um, uh, you get a tax receipt as well. So you... You can donate $50, you get a tax receipt, and you will get access to a folder that gives you all of the past episodes, over 270 episodes. Three podcasts of Patreon episodes, all at your fingertips for a good cause. Mm -hmm. Feel real good about those episodes, you guys. So go to extralife.fromsuperheroes.com. That is E-X-T-R-A-L-I-F-E dot fromsuperheroes.com. Donate today. There's no reason to wait. And uh, we'll see you on November 5th. And that's going to be it uh, for this week. Next week on the podcast, we're going to be back and we're going to be talking about The Scorpion King. Ah, The Scorpion King, the other Egyptian god rock movie in, in, in Build Up to Black Adam. In Build Up to Black Adam. It's weird that we're there's two. The, the, uh, there's... <laughs> 
There is. There's mul- there's multiples. He keeps doing them, baby. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Scorpion King next week. In the meantime, if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach me online at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y. You can reach me at Words of Diana. And you can reach both of us at From Superheroes. And we'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Bye.